What's going on guys, John and Jack here with another episode of Talking Ball and today we're looking at the bigs and the 2017 NBA draft. Specifically, we'll break it break it down by position, power forward and center and this is a class of bigs this year that really doesn't have a cream of the crop type guy unlike some past couple years where you've had Carl Anthony Towns, Jill Okafor, Joel Embiid, uh, Chris Apps Porzingis, some other guys that really were um, far and away, you know, just the top players at their draft class this year, not quite that high. It's really dominated by forwards and, uh, and some uh, guards, of course. But we'll still look, of course, at the power forwards. We'll go with them first. Jack, why don't you break down your top five power forwards? Yeah, an important note here before I get into these power forwards. It's broken down a little bit. Uh, these power forwards are more offensively minded and not going to be able to guard the five position. And then the centers are the guys who you want uh, defensively, um, and they are able to play the five and guard the five, very importantly. So at the number five spot for this power forward list, I have Kyle Kuzma, who really improved a lot throughout his three years at Utah and showed out really nicely at the NBA Combine with a nice three-point stroke. At the number four spot, I have Caleb Biggie Swanigan. And I think, you know, his improvement from – Freshman to sophomore year was dramatic and, you know, averaging over 20 and 10 uh, really showed out well. He's got an NBA body as well. He's got that size. Um, and with his perimeter game now in tow, I think he's got a great chance to have success. Um, you know, a guy similar to him, Jared Selinger, did have the success. But I think Thelonigan's got a much better jump shot um, having already developed it in college. At the number three spot, I have TJ Leaf, the forward from UCLA. Uh, he's he's got a nice polished game already and, and i just think he's gonna be able to score um, very well at the nba level eventually at the number two spot lowry marketing his pac-12 uh counterpart marketing's got a, a great three-point stroke and you know if he can develop some of the other parts of his game could end up being you know a star level type player and my number one power forward if john count scores so inside or 62 percent he does have an outside stroke um, that he's going to show off next season or maybe the season after. I think he does have at least a corner three in his game and it's just going to be a very efficient NBA scorer from the get-go. If he turns up his defensive intensity, watch out. This guy could be a very, very good player and a steal in this draft. So, Jack, you have Markinen and Collins as your 2 and one respectively. How far apart do you think these two players are uh, in your own opinion, do you think they're they're pretty close, or do you think there's there's a sizable gap between them? I don't think there's a sizable gap at all. Um, and and Markkinen really, you know, if he can, he just needs to be able to become more mobile more than anything. Mm -hmm. And you know, his, his three point shot, I think, is definitely the reason why at at seven feet, why he's projected to be a top ten pick. And you know, John Collins is really projected to go between. 12 and, and 20 um, and because Collins wasn't able to show off that three-point stroke at Wake Forest and he didn't really need to I think is is also what happened and he was just able to score in the block now he did he does struggle at times ex exploding through contact um, but he's much more physical much more uh, able to score in the interior over marketing and I think that's valuable especially in today's NBA um, where the, the focus on is on the outside but people tend to forget that if you have a guy who can score in the interior it opens everything else up all right so speaking of the interior let's move on to the centers here there are you know some some pretty good guys there's one clear top center jack obviously that i'll let you get to and then the rest of them are are generally pretty raw players that uh, are going to take some time some seasoning to become um you know, contributors for an NBA team. So, Jack, why don't you start us off here with the top five centers in your mind for this draft class? Yeah, actually, for, for that reason, there's a, a couple of guys who are going to be higher up in mock drafts than you'll see that you probably won't see, rather, in my top five. Um, and, and it's because they are so wrong, and I'm not convinced that they're going to be able to put all their tools together. So, at my... Five spot, I have Harry Giles, and for the simple fact that he has the tools already, it's not a question to me of whether he can put it together, it's just a question of whether he'll be healthy enough to be able to do so. Um, and, and therefore, I have him at the number five spot um, because I think if he's healthy enough, he's got a chance to be a, a very good NBA performer. 
But it, it, the question marks are just so great, you can't put them up any higher than that. Number four spot, I have EK and Igbogu. Uh, he definitely fits into the description John gave. He's very raw, having come off the bench behind uh, TJ Leaf, uh, GG uh, Goleman there in, in, in UCLA, um, and, and Thomas Welsh as well, and only playing you know, 13, 14 minutes a game. He's going to need lots of NBA reps, but he's got the, the frame, the athleticism that could lead to success at that position. Same goes for the number three guy here. Bam at a bio. I just think Bam, while a year and a half older, is is a bit more developed, and you can't guarantee development. And, and Bam, you know, shooting over sixty percent from the line, a bit more. Um, he doesn't he, he doesn't commit as many dumb fouls, uh, for lack of a better term, as Ikanik Bogu, and it's just more you know uh, refined as a player right now. Yes, he is a year and a half older, so. You know, potential versus what you have right now really is what you're weighing with those two guys. Um, and speaking of that argument, Jordan Bell is my number two center. And the reason is because he, he as a senior uh, at Oregon, I just think he's going to come in and be the guy. You know, everyone's looking for the next Malcolm Brogdon. They're looking at the wing position. Well, I think it's Jordan Bell at the center position. He's going to go near the end of the first round, maybe early second, and come in right away and be able to contribute to a good team. Um, and my number one center is Zach Collins, just because I, I look at him and I think he's going to be able to shoot from the short corner as well as defend the fire position. You don't really uh, get that a lot, especially with seven foot size, and he's sturdy as well. He He's not one of these, he's not like Markkinen, who um, is more perimeter oriented. He can play in the post as well. Um, and it's efficient there. Shot over 70% from the free throw line. So he's got a good stroke and, and really is the most uh, polished of the center prospects. So Jack, just speaking a little bit about Collins because he seems to be probably the consensus big man in this draft class among all draft Knicks really, draft pundits. Um, Collins, do you think he's a guy who can be a, a number one type player for a team or does he need to be a number two or even maybe number three guy to have a successful NBA career? Well, I think right now he's, he's a number three, number four type guy scoring okay. wise, but he's going to be able to do uh, a lot of other things and he's the chance to develop, I think, into being maybe number two, number three type scorer on your team, but he'll, I don't think he'll ever be the number one uh, scoring option on the team. All right, so let's get into some sleepers now from the big position. Jack, who are the, some of the sleepers that you're looking at later on in this draft who can make an impact for an NBA team? Right, so one guy for me is uh, Jonathan Motley. Uh, you know, he's, he's in terms of consistency, you definitely have those questions. If you watch the game, John, and I watch the game, we could come back and, you know, have a conversation about him. And it could be, you know, we're, it seemed like we're talking about two different players. Right. Uh, we, we both watched Jonathan Motley. Um, and, and so if he gets his consistency together, he has the tools. 6'9", with 7'4", wingspan, and, and a three-point shooting ability that he, you know, unlike uh, John Collins, who didn't shoot any threes at all, Motley shot them. He just didn't shoot them very well. Um, and, and he, I mean, he only, he shot less than one a game, but he still attempted them and it just wasn't working out for him. So if he can improve that, it, it could, you know, he could be a three point shooting five man or at least a four who plays some small ball five, I guess. Um, but he does, he is, he does have the size, uh, for that position. All right, guys, that is our breakdown for the big position in the 2017 NBA draft class. Let us know what you think. If you agree, if you disagree, what does your top five list look like? Remember to like, share, comment, and subscribe. Thanks for listening, guys. We're out.